Hi, this is Tim Belcher and welcome to my shop. We're working on renovating a kitchen and specifically we're adding a small island and the designer said she wanted to use butcher block countertop and I thought wouldn't it be interesting if we could do a huge in-grain cutting board butcher block countertop and maybe even throw an inlay in. This is how I made it. The countertop needed to be 3 inches thick and 39 and a quarter inches across. I spent a few hours in SketchUp working with different dimensions of each block of ingrain to come up with a design. I realized early on that the entirety of the countertop did not need to be 3 inches. If the outside border were 3 inches thick, the majority of the countertop could be an inch and a half. This design decision helped save material but did cause quite a few problems later in the build. It turned out the boards were simply far too long and heavy to safely use my thickness planner, so I decided to use the CNC. These large format CNC machines are very good at flattening slabs or large pieces of lumber. In fact, in addition to the traditional CNC tasks, you're actually purchasing a large, albeit very slow, planer, joiner, and even mortiser. And while that may seem like only justification for the purchase, which in my case was certainly true, I realized that using the CNC gave me some level of freedom in the design of the countertop. I didn't need to work the material to a specific dimension for the design. I could simply aim to get the largest ingrained blocks that were possible from this lumber and then go back and adjust my model. I also didn't have to worry about shortening the stock or planer snipe, which on my small planer is minimized but sort of inevitable. Instead, I focused the material prep on getting the widest and thickest material possible. I could ignore the length and end up with the largest ingrain blocks I could manage for my countertop. In total, I prepped five large pieces, and in the end, I used just over three of them for this build. And while this timber was fairly straight, there was some level of cupping, and the total thickness for all the boards ended up being just under two and three quarters. I don't currently have a joiner in the shop, and I typically use a joining sled on the table saw. My current sled is built using three-quarter material, and the full depth of cut on the saw stop is only 3.2 inches. Uh, again, chasing that largest block size possible, I, I quickly whipped up a temporary sled using only half-inch material. This jig lets me securely clamp one face down and get one perpendicular edge. And you can see here how close this cut is to the full capacity of the saw. I take each of the boards through with a sled, and then finally through the table saw to clean up the last edge. And I'm left with my final dimensions. So I've got my lumber dimension directly. Just over two and a half inches in height. I guess that would be width of each strip when it's turning its end grain. And I went back and given the actual dimensions and worked up a template. And this template has 18 3 inch, almost 11 inch segments and 25 uh, 11 inch, 1 and a half inch deep segments and a number of shorter segments to fill in the rest. So I've set up my miter saw station, tuned it in to make sure I'm getting as close to 90 degrees as possible, and have a lot of cuts to do. I need to glue these segments end to end, which is not the strongest of joints. I'll need to clamp both end to end with some moderate amount of pressure as well as clamp them with some lateral pressure to keep each segment as straight as possible. So I made up this clamping jig and it is large enough and has enough dividers in the middle that I can glue up four segments at a time. And I'm taking my time 
and test fitting, test clamping without glue, each of the segments. I'm also taking my time to pay attention to the grain and keeping notes as I go so that each line will have alternating grain patterns across the entirety of the countertop. And what you see here is the bottom of the countertop facing up. And I'm more worried about no gaps across the seams at the top or the bottom of this glue up. And when I test clamp something, I can actually pick it up and check the gaps, make sure that the gaps are clean and square. I don't necessarily care if they're flat on any surface, the sides, the top, or the bottom. All of that's gonna get resurfaced on the CNC machine before we glue up the final large panel. But I want no gaps, primarily. And if I notice that I'm getting a tiny gap on the top, or the bottom of this glue up, then I'll throw in small pieces of shim material, cut off some popsicle sticks near the bottom to give a little bit more clamping pressure on the top of the piece. I did this for all 17 of the segments. So a little bit of a late night, but I ended up getting everything glued up in segments and the joints seem fairly tight. So I'm going to end up taking each one of these and putting it on the CNC machine flat and removing about a sixteenth of an inch from both sides. Right now, these things measure in at about 2.55 inches and I want according to my plans, to get them down to about 2.44. So not quite a sixteenth of an inch, uh, but close. I've got them numbered, and before I start planing these and getting them uh, flat on both sides, I need to make a template. So I'm going to throw a piece of half-inch MDF on the table and cut a template for the final dimensions of the actual countertop along with a way to help me find center on this piece because I'm going to need that later. While I'm at that, I'm going to go ahead and throw some more MDF on the table and create a long sanding block because I know once I run these through, I'm going to end up needing to sand the machine surfaces just a little bit to get a much flusher, much tighter joint. Here I'm making that sanding block with 60 grit. And back to the CNC to surface those segments. Once everything was set up, this really didn't take more than a couple of minutes per side. It was a reasonably mindless task of setting up a fairly shallow pocket toolpath just taking enough off of each side to make sure both sides were flat and parallel. And the sanding plane worked really well to speed things up. All in, all of these took me only a few hours. Then it was ready for the glue up. I carefully traced the template both inside and out to help with alignment, did a dry run, and then uh, perhaps ill-advisedly did the glue up in one fairly stressful go.
Everything worked out though. The joints were strong and tight, and the next part of the build was fairly easy. Stay. I first needed to get the bottom flat, and that was fairly simple, and then figure out a way to both flatten the top as well as cut the chamfer and the actual profile of the countertop. I say figure out because I knew I wanted to cut all the way through the blank for the profile, so I needed a way to hold the blank down to the table while I made that cut. I ended up using the longer blocks on the underside to secure the blank to pieces of MDF, both inside and outside of what would be the profile cut, and I did this with some painter's tape and CA glue. And this would let me clamp the blank down with the MDF panels and cut all the way through the blank. The MDF would then keep the blank secured to the table. Stay. Once the top was flattened, I needed again to find the center. Then I could make a chamfer pass around the entire perimeter. And then using a six inch end mill, finally the full depth profile cut. The way I fastened the blank seemed to work. There was a mistake in the profile, which cut the circle about a quarter of an inch off, which ruined the chamfer. But I designed an extra quarter of an inch into the height to give me some room for error. I ended up just resurfacing down the top and recutting the chamfer. And at this point, with some sanding, I had my countertop. And like many of my projects, after all this hard work, this is where I decided to do something that uh, could ruin it. From the beginning, I was considering trying to inlay a compass rose into the countertop. This video will not necessarily be a deep dive into inlay techniques, and in this case specifically the V-carve technique. However, I have had, let's say, mixed results in the past with V-carve inlays. Inlays that are small and thin seem to work fine. Larger or wider inlays seem to fail just as often as not. And this inlay was going to be my largest attempt by far, at around three feet across. I'll try and speed my way through the prep for the actual inlay blank. It's a nice piece of cherry and should provide a nice contrast with a hard maple. To prepare for the inlay, I again went back and watched quite a few Vectric and other V-Carve tutorials. The basic premise is that using a V-bit, or essentially a triangular cutting bit, in my case a 60 degree bit, you cut the female pocket in the main blank, then you reverse your image and cut the male inlay into the inlay blank. Because you are using the same V-bit for both, and because the machine can raise and lower the cutter as it does the small details, you can get clean and crisp corners for the inlay. Here I'm laying out the blank for the final glue up, which I'll simply do in place on the table. And while that was drying, I sanded the countertop to try and remove the tool marks. You could barely feel those tool marks with your hand, and they took hours and hours to remove with 40 grit. I did the inlay first, starting with getting it flat, and then carving that male reverse image. Uh, being ingrained, the cuts did leave quite a bit of cleanup for me. Then there was that point of no return, 
carving the actual countertop. Some quick work at the bandsaw to free the inlay. Some test fitting and prep for the glue. And onto the glue up itself. I had thought the previous glue up was stressful. Uh, this one was much worse. Not only is it a large surface area to glue, but I had to be innovative about how to clamp it. Nevertheless, I felt confident going to bed that night. Everything had gone according to plan. After waiting 24 hours or so, I just needed to remove the rest of the inlay. And it had failed in a number of ways. I was pretty confident last night that it was a success. And you can see, I mean, without the oil, how muted the inlay was going to be. It was going to be this slightly darker cherry over this maple. But and even the parts that seem like uh, they're a success, they're just too thin. You can poke through them. Not enough of the inlay actually got down into the groove, and I don't know why. Maybe the ingrain swelled with the glue, or maybe I just don't know what I'm doing, which is more likely. So I think I'm gonna surface the entire thing down 0.2 inches. Get it back to flat without the inlay, and I think we're just going to have a beautiful ingrain butcher block countertop with no inlay in it, because I really just don't have any extra height to give to this any longer. And that's what I did. I resurfaced it that night and recut the chamfers both top and bottom. I was going to settle. It's been about a week and a half since I've worked on this project. Mostly due to a scheduled family vacation. But I'd be lying to say the failure at the inlay didn't significantly impact my, my enthusiasm about the project. I woke up the next morning and I looked at it for about two minutes and thought, every time I see this, I'm going to regret not trying again to get that inlay to work. Grabbed a piece of cherry, milled it, glued up a new blank and went to work looking at my inlay settings and what I found was that the way Vectric teaches you to do an inlay, a V-carve inlay specifically, is to split the difference between the start depth and the flat depth. So a 0.2 inch inlay would have a start depth on the male side of 0.1 and a flat depth of 0.1 and what that does is it leaves a gap in the actual inlay underneath and over top. The over top gap lets you easily remove the waste wood to reveal your inlay. Uh, but the under gap, especially on a cutting board, is seriously a problem. You're relying on this small 0.1 of an inch edge grain glue to hold the inlay in place. And what you really want is nearly a full inlay. You've got to be careful when you do the full inlay, if you were to just do a start depth of 0.25, if it bottoms out, you may end up with gaps around the edge. So you can't just do a no inlay or a no start depth inlay. You need to provide a little bit of room for glue. And what I found is that a start depth of, for a quarter inch inlay, a start depth of 0.23 inches and a flat depth of 0 0.02 inches gives me just enough of a gap that the glue should solidify underneath and hold down as well. So I had my new settings and it was back to work redoing the inlay. And just as I was getting ready to carve the inlay into the countertop, I ran into my biggest problem yet. I got the big butcher block back out, ready to sand and prep it today. And over the course of this entire project, once I got this butcher block glued up, I've had trouble with wood movement. The trouble's been opposite of what you're seeing here. Before now, 
the wood would actually overnight would dome, would rise in the center as opposed to the edge. Remember the edge has a fairly thick three inch band and this is about an inch and a half. Twice I've had to, to flatten, reflatten the surface to remove the dome and the dome is perfectly circular. I thought originally that it was actually a machining issue because it was so uh, circular. But it's not, and I, when I left for a week and a half, I left this on its top, and I was fairly certain that it hadn't moved, that it was a good position to leave it. And today I find that it's actually created about a quarter inch uh, dome in the other direction, or downward in the middle. I finally figured out that the wood was breathing. As it sat on the table with all that ingrain exposed, Air and moisture could get to the top but not the bottom, and that would cause it to swell in that direction. I now assume the blank would have been fairly stable if it was elevated to allow proper airflow. So I left it in exactly this position for more than a week, and sure enough it slowly moved towards flat. The inlay was prepped and standing by, and I was sort of trying to time it so I could cut on a flat surface and then one day it was ready to go. And yet another fairly stressful glue up. Looking back, this was a fairly challenging build. As I was researching the wood movement issues, I came across an old timers woodworking forum on the internet where someone asked if you could build an entire table out of ingrain. One of the older guys responded that it would be a very bad idea and need to be at least three or four inches thick to prevent movement. And I'm glad I found that post after I made this. Making for me is not about showing off the things I build. It's about the work, the learning, the failures, and figuring out how to overcome them. If you like this video, please subscribe, leave me a comment and give it a like. Thanks for watching.